We have five studies on the prophecy of Daniel. You would need 500 to do it properly. And so we're going to focus, of course, on the basic prophetic sections of the book of Daniel. And many in this room will have done that over and over again over their lifetime, but there will be some here that haven't. And so we're going to try and start with the very simple basic things and work ourselves up from there. And so brothers and sisters and young people, we've distri distributed to you some documents and one of the most important of those is the chart that you will have received or you might have even printed off for yourself at home because we did send it on to Brother Peter. The chart on the kingdom of men of Christadelphian teaching since 1848. Now, I'm going to make a, a statement and that statement I think will be agreed to by most. That you have no hope or very little hope of fully understanding the apocalypse, the book of Revelation, unless you have a good solid basis in the prophecy of Daniel. And so that's why this study is so important. For those of you who either want to move on to study the apocalypse or want to make it even more clear than it is in your mind already, then the prophecy of Daniel is essential for that. And if you have a look at that chart, what you will see there is, obviously, we've got Nebuchadnezzar's image over on the left-hand side. You'll see a shadow of that on the right-hand side, more about that a little later on tonight. But what you have here, of course, is also some imagery that comes from the book of Revelation. And this chart endeavours to set out the connections between Daniel and the book of Revelation. And I'm going to issue a challenge to you, for those of you who are not really, uh, uh, you know, experts on the subject. The challenge is this. By the time we finish this series in 10 weeks' time or so, God willing, I want you to be able not only to interpret this chart for yourself, but to be able to explain it to others. Now, I don't think that's too much to ask. It may be probably a little bit too much for some of the younger ones, but I don't think it's too much to ask from those who are a little way down the track in Bible study. So when you look at a chart like that, you can be sort of overwhelmed by it initially. We want to go through this study in a way that makes it clear. I think this is one of the most brilliant charts that's ever been produced in our community, to be honest. And if everybody had a good understanding of what this chart contains, then we wouldn't have so many problems that our community seems to have on Bible prophecy. We wouldn't have so many ridiculous ideas coming forward on Bible prophecy. I receive every second day emails, ridiculous stuff. If that foundation had been laid properly, this wouldn't be happening. And so that's why this is so important to us. Now I'm going to show you this chart right at the end of tonight's session as well and point out one very interesting thing. I'm just going to give you a bit of a heads up on that because our next study, God willing, is going to be primarily on the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7. And this chart shows the connection between Nebuchadnezzar's image. And you notice I'm not saying Daniel's image, as sometimes we hear. It's not Daniel's image. It was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It was Daniel who interpreted the dream. It's Nebuchadnezzar's. And that's important. You know why? Because this image is about, as the chart says, the kingdom of men. And Daniel wanted nothing to do with the kingdom of men. He wanted it to be replaced by the kingdom of God. And of course, the reason we have an image of a man, all right, the images of a man, a dreadful man, by the way, is because that's how Nebuchadnezzar saw himself and that's why he built a whole image of gold in chapter 3. That's how he saw himself. But when you get to chapter 7, you see how God views the kingdom of men. And he views them as wild, rapacious beasts. That's his perspective of the kingdom of men. I want you to notice one little thing, and I'll point it out again at the end. See, you've got the image, then you've got the lion of chapter 7. You notice the little number 1 here? That's because you see it relates to the head of the image. Notice the bear has got number 2. You've got the winged leopard, number 3. Where's number 4? Number four on this chart is right over here on the right-hand side, okay? The fourth beast of Daniel, because it's all to do with the Roman Empire revived in the latter days to be destroyed by Christ and the saints. So there's a first little hint as to how to interpret this chart, and we'll see the value of it as we proceed. But, true to my word, we're going to start very simply. 
we're going to go back to the fundamentals, the very basic fundamentals, because this study and the book of Daniel is essentially about the contest between two kingdoms. The kingdom of men established by Nimrod 100 years after the flood and the kingdom of God established by God at Mount Sinai when he made Israel a kingdom of priests. Okay? It's this great contest between these two kingdoms. That's what this prophecy is about. And of course the ultimate outcome will be verse 44 of Daniel chapter 2. In the days of these kings, that is the kings that we see and I see developing in Europe now, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's the outcome of this contest. The kingdom of men will be swallowed up, destroyed, stamped upon by the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to come, if you would, to Revelation chapter 11. Because this subject of the kingdom of men versus the kingdom of God is the theme of this verse, Revelation 11 and verse 15. Now, I take you here, not because it's not on the screen, it's on the screen, but because I want you, if you haven't done this, to use a pencil or some other instrument and cross off one letter in this verse. Just the one letter. Revelation 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, and it's, this is what the King James says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What you have on the screen is Rotherham's translation. Now, Rotherham is pretty literal. When it's singular, he gives you the singular. When it's plural, he gives you the plural, for the most part. This is how it should read. And the little letter you cross off the end of the word kingdoms is the letter S at the end, because it's singular. The kingdom of the world, or the kingdom of men, hath become the kingdom. Notice again, you can, well that word's in italics anyway, in the AV. The kingdom of, of our Lord and of his Christ. So one kingdom is superseded by another kingdom. Get the idea of that? Now if you don't think that's right, have a look at the RSV. A little bit looser, but still very, very good. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Take the diaglot, which is quite literal. Became the kingdom of the world, of the Lord of us and of the anointed of him. You know, it doesn't really sound all that fluent, does it? But you get the idea? The idea is clear, isn't it? That the kingdom of men is to be overthrown and replaced by the kingdom of God. I said I was going to start simply. I think that's pretty simple, isn't it? But it's very, very important. So let's just step back and review the kingdom of God on earth. We know when the kingdom of men was established, that was established by Nimrod. But what about the kingdom of God? Well, we know this in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 23, that Solomon sat on the throne of Yahweh as king instead of David his father and prospered. And all Israel obeyed him. You get that again in, in chapter 28 that precedes it. Hence the disciples asked our Lord Jesus Christ just before he was whipped away into heaven by the angels in Acts chapter 1 verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In other words, it had existed. It was no longer in existence and they wanted to see its restoration. And he said, of course, the time will eventually come. So the kingdom of God in the past was proclaimed by God at Sinai. Now, I'm not going to take you to these references, but they are quite important in the scheme of things. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, Yahweh takes Israel as his wife, as his bride, at Sinai. And he declares them to be a peculiar people, a special nation, a, a privileged nation, and he calls them a kingdom of priests. That's when the kingdom of God was established on the earth. Now, of course, it related only to Israel. Ultimately, of course, it's going to be universal. 
Yahweh was Israel's first king. We know from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, that Israel rejected him in the days, the, the last days of Samuel. And Samuel was grieved by that. But God said to him, you shouldn't be grieving, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They have rejected me from being their king. So he was the king of the kingdom of God on earth in the nation of Israel. Israel, of course, were the subjects of that kingdom, as we're told in Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 and 6. The land of Canaan was the territory of the kingdom, Exodus 3, 17, and Leviticus 25, verse 23. Yahweh says to Israel through Moses, you can't sell the land. It's not yours. It's mine. It's my land. And he was, of course, the king of that land, the kingdom of God on earth. And so anointed kings sat on God's throne, as we saw in the first of Chronicles 29, 23, and again in 28 and verse 5. And through, of course, disobedience over centuries, the throne of David was ultimately overturned. In Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 25 to 27, we know those well-known words, I will overturn it, overturn it, overturn it, until he come whose right it is, and he will sit upon the throne of David. So there's a little bit of a review of things that are well known amongst us. This is the simple foundation upon which we want to build our study on Daniel. And of course we have this overarching principle that governs the outcome and the process that leads to the outcome. We, we know this passage very well, don't we? Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, the watchers of course being the angels, the ones who are manipulating the affairs of the nations right now, and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living, because it doesn't do the dead any good, to the living, that the living might know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. Notice the language. The most high rules kingdom, singular, in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. And we've seen a few of those, of course, in our times. So how do we know that this is true? How do we know that this rule, this principle, which governs the outcome of God's purpose on earth, how do we know it's true? Well, we look at Daniel chapter 2, because it tells us this is fundamental. It's known by even many Christian religions around us. It's, this is fundamental to our understanding. But of course, we want to just add a little few extra things that they don't know about tonight. World history was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. And we pick this up from Daniel chapter 2 and verse 29. Now verse 29, of course, comes after verse 28. And in a moment, I'm going to step you back to verse 28 because that is the most important verse in this chapter. But let's start with verse 29 of Daniel chapter 2. Where we read these words as Daniel begins to unravel this dream. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed... What should come to pass hereafter? Now that little phrase is very important. What shall come to pass hereafter? If I said to you tonight that hereafter this meeting I'm going to return home, you would have no problem with that and you wouldn't expect that to happen a thousand years time, would you? It means now, alright? It means from here on, from day one, this is what's going to happen hereafter. So what we have then in the interpretation of this dream is the unfolding of human history from the times of Nebuchadnezzar, who of course is referred to in verse 38. Thou, O king, art the head of gold. So it's going to unfold what will come to pass hereafter. But, and it's a big but, that's not the most important thing that we find in Daniel chapter 2. It is helpful, it is, ex it is something that is very, very useful to understand that the hand of God has been involved from that time right down to our day. We can see it. It's undeniable. It tells us that God is in control, that he rules in the kingdom of men. That's why it's important. But it's not essentially what Daniel chapter 2 is about. Verse 28 is what it's about, and we'll come to that in a minute. So here we have the first thing that's important, the unfolding of human history from the times of Nebuchadnezzar. So what did he see? Well, we read it, didn't we? We read from verse 31 through 34 the description of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. 
Thou, O King, we read in verse 31, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Now, this word terrible, decal, means to slink in fear. To have, it has the idea of being so terrible or formidable that you slink away from him. It, it generates fear. We would use the word terrifying, which is pretty close to terrible, isn't it? But terrifying is probably a better translation in the sense that it caused terror and Nebuchadnezzar himself was frightened by what he saw in the dream. So what did he see? This image's head, we read, was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. What an unusual image. It's got all of these metals in it. And of course we know what these metals represent, as we shall see in a moment. But then something dramatic happened. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which of course has the idea of no human involvement. This is a divine overthrow of the kingdom of men which smote the image upon his feet, which tells you the time when that would happen. It wouldn't happen in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't going to happen in the days of Persia or Greece or Rome. It was going to happen at the time of the feet, right in the latter days, as we shall see in a moment. It goes, it says, it goes on to say, which smote the image upon his feet that were of, of iron and clay and break them to pieces. And of course, what that really means is that we, un we need to understand pretty well what those feet represent and whether or not they exist today. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. So let's just have a look at what Daniel is saying to Nebuchadnezzar. He is telling him what is going to come to pass hereafter. That's why in verse 38, he interprets the golden head as being Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom and the, the silver, the, per the Medo-Persians and so on. And of course, we've known this for a long time, haven't we? The value of understanding Nebuchadnezzar's image. We have the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire from BC 606 to 539 when it was overthrown by Cyrus, whose empire lasted to 334. It was the silver chest and arms, the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great and those who succeeded him from BC 334 to 67. And the Roman Empire, of course, the, the, the Empire of Iron, from BC 67 through to AD 476 when the barbarians finally overthrew it. And out of that, of course, the barbarian invasions, the breaking up of the Roman Empire, came what we see today. This mixture of iron and clay. And we'll talk more about what that represents in a second. Okay, so you've got this image. And we understand it and we know how important it is. And we use it very often in our lectures uh, to those who might come to listen. So what about these feet? and the ten toes that are on those feet. In Elpis Israel, Brother Thomas, and this is way back in 1848, of course, he wrote these words in Elpis Israel, part three. He says, I enumerate the toe kingdoms as follows. Belgium, France, Spain, Portugal, Naples, Sardinia, Greece, Hungary, Lombardy, and Bavaria. Now, you notice the ones in yellow on the screen? Naples, Sardinia, and Lombardy. They were separate kingdoms, separate states in 1848, but not today. Those three today are one country, the country of Italy. So we have to find a couple more, don't we? Because the three become one as history has gone. This is 170 years ago, remember? So it's a long time ago. We have to find another two. And of course, that other two will reveal themselves in due time. But then he adds in this last paragraph, he says, I have not named Britain, although the island was part of the Roman Empire, uh, Roman Dominion. And of course it was. For nearly 500 years, Britain was part of the Roman Empire. And it's not going to play a part as part of the image in the day when it's destroyed. So we're going to have to, to find out why it isn't. And in, in our next study, God willing, we'll look at why Britain is not part of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And of course there's a very, very good proof for it. Brother Thomas also added this on page 326 of Opus Israel. He said, these strong and broken toe kingdoms 
have existed upwards of 13 centuries. Now it would have been a bit more in our time. They are still in being, but not as originally established. But then these are the important words. This the prophecy does not require. All that is necessary is that there should be 10 kingdoms at the time the image is smitten by the stone. Now I've had people come to me for the last 20 or 30 years saying, oh, you know, we've got 27, 28 nations of the European Union. Does it have to be 10? Yes, it does. Because that's what the scripture says. You can have 158 nations in the European Union and it's still going to be 10 at the time the image is destroyed. So let's accept the scripture simply. I mean, it says it, that there are 10 toes, which means 10 separate nations or kingdoms who form part of that confederacy that's destroyed by Christ and the saints. That means, of course, that the European Union as we know it today will be ended. It will come to an end in due time. And we'll, we'll end up with 10, but more about that in subsequent studies. Brother Thomas also says this in that section in Opus Israel, pages 327 and 328. He identifies the power that will bring all the territories of the former empires into one image power. He says, I shall be able to show from other parts of the prophetic word that the power destined to play the conspicuous part indicated above is Russia. I mean, how accurate is that as we witness remarkable things today in 2022? That it will dominate all the ten kingdoms, subdue Turkey and incorporate Persia, which is not just Iran but that entire region from Syria across to the Indus River, into its empire, but that when it has reached its zenith, it will in turn be precipitated into the abyss and its dominion suppressed for a thousand years. He goes on to say this, the ten kingdoms enumerated above, the ones he's just spelled out a little previously, are all within the Roman limits. There are many other kingdoms beyond its frontiers, like for example, Denmark, and the countries Lithuania, which are part of the European Union, they are beyond the, the limits of the old Roman Empire. That's what he's talking about. He says there are many other kingdoms beyond its frontiers resting upon territory that never belong to Rome or the Iron Dominion. Therefore, they must not be named in the same category. Nebuchadnezzar's image, and this is a very important statement that he makes in Elpis Israel, Nebuchadnezzar's image has to do only with powers occupying the area of the golden, silver, brazen and iron dominions. Other prophecies survey the rest. So this is, these are very fundamental things that need to be understood if you're going to come to terms with the prophecy of Daniel and in particular Nebuchadnezzar's image. And we need to turn to the feet. This is what he says about the feet in the exposition of Daniel. Page 13 and page 70. He says, the feet of the image and the feet of the dragon, there's your connection between Daniel and the apocalypse, have yet to be formed out of existing elements. And it is the king of the north's mission to accomplish the work. He goes on on page 70 to say, now while the head, breast and arms, belly, thighs, legs and toes have all existed, the feet have not yet been formed. Now he wrote this in 1854 and they still haven't been formed. We don't have the feet of the image yet. Anybody here got no feet? Well, you got no feet, I couldn't ask you to stand up, could I? Because if you haven't got feet, you can't stand up. So the image of Nebuchadnezzar doesn't yet exist in the sense of it standing up as it's seen by Nebuchadnezzar. It's a very important point, as you'll see in a moment. But he goes on to say this, so that it has been hitherto impossible for the colossal image to stand erect, as Nebuchadnezzar saw it in his dream. It is therefore the mission of the autocrat, that is, the autocrat of all the rushes, to form the feet and set up the image before the world in all its excellent brightness and terribleness of form, that all men subject to the kingdom of Babylon may worship the work of its creator's power. 
You know, brothers and sisters and young people, I marvel at the accuracy of interpretation of Brother Thomas 170 years ago. He wasn't seeing the things we're seeing. But he had this understanding because he understood his Bible. We don't interpret Bible prophecy on the, on the basis of what we see. We interpret it on the basis of what we read. And if you read it correctly, you'll get a proper understanding. And it doesn't matter which way events are going. It doesn't matter that the press is telling you that Putin has made a big mistake in Ukraine, that he's going to get thumped in the nose, in the nose and that he's going to be chased back to Moscow. It doesn't matter what they're saying. If the Bible says that Russia's going to control Europe, Russia will control Europe. And if you read my latest update, you'll know how that's going to happen, I believe. It'll happen because the world's on the verge of the greatest depression in human history. And if you go back and look at the history of, of the times before World War II, you'll see the pattern was set. The angels gave us the pattern. A lot of things changed that seemed impossible at the time, absolutely impossible, but they became realities within a couple of years, and it's going to happen all over again. Let's have a look at these feet, shall we? Come to verses 41 to 43 of Daniel chapter 2. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. It, is divi it was divided, of course, into two parts, wasn't it? The Roman Empire became two parts. The kingdom shall be divided. And it says, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. Now, once the Roman Empire ended as a military power, where was its strength? Its strength was in its religion the Roman Catholic Church. And that's very important to understand because when we have the feet, we don't have a Roman Empire yet. We're going to get a revival of the territory of the Roman Empire pretty soon. But we don't have a Roman Empire yet. It's gone. It's been gone since 476, 493. So what, what is the iron? It's not the empire. It's what's left of the empire, which has been as successful, if not more successful, than the military forces of Rome. It's their religion. Billions, billions of Catholics around the world who follow, of course, the dictates of the church. So what we have here is very, very interesting because this is our times. This is the time when the kingdom of God is set up, as we know from verse 44, in the days of these kings. The kings represented by the ten toes on the feet of the image. Let's read on. It says, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now stop for a second. You see this word mixed in the green on the screen here? Little number one takes you down to, the, to this word. It's garav. It means primarily to co-mingle. We'd use the word mix for co-mingling something, wouldn't we? That's good. But in the Hebrew, the root means to break or to intermix and even to traffic as if by bartering. So when you go to a marketplace, what are you doing? You're intermingling with people, you see, and of course you can trade in that environment. So this word progressively came to mean to go into a marketplace and even then to become a guarantor in a marketplace. Guess what? In 1957, six nations went to the Vatican, went to Rome, and they signed the European Economic Agreement became the EEC and the Pope was there to underwrite that document. It was six nations, by the way, which is interesting, isn't it? It's the, it's the arm of the flesh that's involved here. And there the Pope was underwriting the European Union as we know it today. And he's going to get a lot of power back. Let's read verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed, notice this is the same word, garab, with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, so it's a brittle union, even as iron is not mixed or commingled with clay. So you can put them together, but they don't stick together all that well. And one blow, of course, and it all falls apart. But that's what this word here means. It's translated elsewhere in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 44, verse 32, when Judah says to Joseph, he says, I was the guarantor. I gave guarantee to my father Jacob that I would bring Benjamin back. 
I'm the guarantor. I went surety. It's translated the same way in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1, 11, 15, and 20, verse 16, where, where the wisdom of the word of God tells us don't stand as a guarantor for anyone. Don't become a surety. That's not good news for young men who want to buy a motor vehicle and have to go to their parents and say, can you stand guarantor for my, for my loan? Well, for your kid, maybe, if it's a, he's a responsible kid, that might not be too bad. But don't do it for your next-door neighbour. Don't stand surety for anybody because you'll get caught. All right, That's what the wisdom of the Proverbs tells us. But that's the meaning of the word, and that's why it was so important that the Pope be involved in the European Union's origins back in 1957. Listen to the words of Brother Sully in a moment. Now, did you read that carefully? It says in verse 43 that whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Go back in history. Who was it that mixed itself with the empire of Rome symbolised by iron? It was the barbarians, wasn't it? The barbarians came from all over and they came in and they mingled themselves with the iron of the Roman Empire. That's not what this verse is talking about, is it? What's this verse talking about? It's talking about the iron mingling itself with the clay. Not the historical mingling of the clay with the iron, but the iron with the clay. When's that going to happen? Well, it's been happening. This is what Brother Sally says about that. This is from the back section of the Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy. If you haven't read that, you have, of course, robbed yourself of a lot of valuable information. He, this is what he says about the iron mingling with the clay. In the second chapter of Daniel, the kingdoms of men, and I would have preferred him to use the singular, by the way, but he doesn't, are represented by a composite image consisting of four principal elements. First, gold, second, silver, third, brass, and fourth, iron. Each element representing some phase of the kingdoms of men, or the kingdom of men. Then he says this, and this is the important part. This is his understanding of verses 41 and 43 of Daniel chapter 2. The fourth element, in its latter-day phase, assumes the aspect of clay and iron mixed. That is, and he interprets what they mean. Republicanism. Stop. Let's just reflect upon that. What's republicanism? All the nations of Europe are republics. I mean, even China calls itself a republic, which is ridiculous. But anyway, all the nations of Europe are republics. They are democracies. Australia is a democracy. It's not a republic yet. Some would like it to be a republic against scripture. But it's not a republic yet, but it's a democracy. So what we're talking about here is democracies. And they're represented by clay. And clay, of course, is what man was made out of by the angels. So, of course, it's, it's called also in this passage the seed of men. Right? It's the spirit of men ruling for themselves. So you've got this democ democracy or this republic spirit represented by the clay. Republicanism, uh, republicanism and autocracy <coughs> shown perhaps in one of its most subtle aspects, notice these words, in the silent capture of democracy by autocratic ecclesiasticism. In other words, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, enabling the latter to ride into power thereby. Now, the latter is autocracy. And, of course, we know that Gog is called an autocrat. Brother Thomas calls him the autocrat of all the Russias. So how is Putin going to get power in Europe? Is he going to do what he's doing to Ukraine, to Germany and to France and those nations of Europe? No, he's not. He's going to use the papacy. He's going to use the papacy which will gain enormous power when this Great Depression hits the world. Thankfully we'll look at this from another place. We will be at Sinai, brothers and sisters and young people, looking at what's happening as the angels bring about the situation that must exist before Armageddon. And there's a few things to be accomplished, but it will be accomplished by what's called the time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation on earth. And times of trouble are known to change things very rapidly, don't they? 
two years of COVID will tell you that. Times of trouble change things very rapidly. And that's going to happen all over again. And we're going to see the silent capture of those democratic states by the influence of the papacy on behalf of the Russian power. That's what Brother Sully is saying. That's how you're going to get your feet formed. Because you see, the outcome of that will be the nations that are south of the Rhine and the Danube, which is the old Roman Empire, and there will be ten of them, will become part of that great confederacy. The feet will have been formed. There'll be five over towards the east and five over towards the west. And of course, we'll talk a bit more about that a little later on. So let's have a summary of what we're seeing here with these feet. When the time comes for the feet of the image to be formed, they will be attached like your feet and mine to the legs of the image power. The western leg is based in Rome and the eastern leg in Constantinople, or as they call it today, Istanbul. Putin, by the way, never calls it Istanbul. He always calls it Constantinople. The ten horns of southern Europe will all be under the control of Gog and religion will be the binding factor. It's that silent capture of democracy by ecclesiastical autocratism when the Pope regains a lot of power in Europe. The religion of the West, Catholicism, is symbolised by iron. That's where the strength comes from. And the religion of the East, of course, we know is symbolised in Daniel chapter 7 by brass. It's a reference to the Greek and to the Russian Orthodox Church. And of course the Russian Orthodox Church came from Constantinople when they were forced out of there in 1453. This is why the fourth beast of Daniel 7 captures with its claws of brass and consumes with its iron teeth. I want to show you those references. Come to Daniel chapter 7. Now this is something that is not always noticed. Look at verse 19 of Daniel chapter 7, first of all. Daniel says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding great, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Now, if you go back to, to verse 7 of chapter 7, you'll notice it also says, describing this beast, towards the end it's, uh, it says, it stamped the residue with the feet of it. We'll, we'll talk about the revenue, uh, residue a bit, a bit later on. <coughs> so what we have here in Daniel 7 and verse 19 is a reference to what beasts do. This fourth beast actually captures its prey with his claws. Now you can, you've seen imagery of, of lions and tigers and leopards capturing their prey. What do they do? Do they bite the animal first? No. They put their claws in, drag it down, then they bite it. Then they eat it. All right. So you start with your claws. That's what you grab hold of a, a, an enemy by or a, a victim by. You start with your claws and then you eat it with your teeth. Got it? The claws are of brass. Why would that be the case? Well, because Gog comes from Constantinople. And the metal of Constantinople, it's Greek. It's Greek Orthodox, okay? The metal of the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, which will back the invasion and promote it, like they have, of course, the invasion of Ukraine, by the way. It's the Russian Orthodox Church behind this. They will back the invasion of the land of Israel from Constantinople, brass, claws, okay? But the papacy is involved in this. The papacy wants the holy sites. The papacy wants the land. The Pope thinks he's the king of Jerusalem. That's one of his titles. Consuming it with the iron teeth. Brazen claws, iron teeth. Got the picture? So pristine, the way the word of God presents. Things that we know will shortly come to pass. The territory of the beast is this territory here, all right? That territory. And Pope John Paul II, when he came to office, said he had a vision for his papacy, which began in 1979. 
And his vision for the papacy was that the Pope would become the emperor of the new Holy Roman Empire reigning from the Urals, and the Urals are of course north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, to the Atlantic, an entire region. And of course, basically that's the Confederacy of Gog. All right, with a few additions, it's the Confederacy of Gog in Europe. So that was the Pope's vision. And that's why they were able to say in Revelation chapter 18, I sit a queen and am no widow. Today the church is basically a widow. Where is its suitor? Where is the one that will put it into power? Where is he? He's sitting in the Kremlin, all right? It's, it's the Gogian power that will put the papacy back into, into office, as it were. And the church will use its influence in Europe to bring those nations into that great confederacy that we know from Ezekiel chapter 38 and elsewhere. Right, take a breath. Because now we come to the most important part of Daniel chapter 2. It's verse 28. Look at verse 28. This is how Daniel begins. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now I'm not going to take you to the references that you'll have in the notes that have been given to you, but if you look them up, you will find that this phrase is used of our times. Take, for example, without turning to it, Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Israel will be without a king, without a priest, without an altar for millennia, centuries. But the time will come, it says, in the latter days that they'll get their king back. All right? He's coming. So the latter days is used there. It is used in Ezekiel 38, of course, verse 16. Uh, and in, in, in the earlier verse, verse 8, of the times in which we're living. And you can have a look at the other references. Jeremiah 30, verse 24, which speaks about Armageddon, and it says it's going to be in the latter days. So when you read that phrase, the latter days, you're talking about our times. So that's why Daniel 2, verse 28, is so important, brothers and sisters and young people. Because it's about our times. Oh yes, the image is there to show the succession of world empires. But that's not what God wants us to focus on. He wants us to see that as the proof that he's at work. He's been at work since the time of Nebuchadnezzar and before. Yes, that convinces you he's been at work, but he wants us to see this as happening in the latter days, the times in which we live. So what's going to happen? Well, look at verse 35, which is on the screen behind me. It says this. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. There's the most important phrase of the verse. Broken to pieces together. You can't break them to pieces together if they're not together. In other words, the image has to stand complete. So all of those past empires of Babylon and Medo-Persia and, and Greece and Rome, the territories that they ruled over have got to be brought into one massive image empire. And when it stands erect in the land of Israel, in the latter days, the stone power of Christ and the saints will destroy it and become the great mountain of the kingdom of God, broken to pieces together. This is the primary purpose of Daniel chapter 2. It's about the overthrow of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of men by the kingdom of God. That's the great contest. This is what Brother Thomas has to say about the Nilpus Israel, page 327. The idea I would convey is well expressed by the prophet, saying, The God in heaven who revealeth secrets maketh known to the king what shall be in the latter days. That is, here's his explanation. That is, there will be in the latter days a dominion ruling over all the countries mainly comprehended in the limits of the successive empires of Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome and represented by the image as a whole and which will be broken by a power from heaven which will utterly destroy it and set up an empire which will cover all the territory it possessed. Okay, that's a brilliant, a brilliant exposition of what we've just been reading here in Daniel chapter 2. 
So let's just review that in picture form. Here's the image. The territories of the four world empires are to be united by Gog, okay, under uh, the Babylonian head. In other words, what do you do with your head, apart from putting it on a pillow at night? What do you do with your head? I mean, you, this is your brain box, isn't it? This, this is where you, what you decide to do, what you do, is, is, is managed by. You decide what you're going to do up here and you manage it, all right? This is the thinking power. So it's the Catholicism of the world. It's the papacy, the, the, the Babylon the Great of the apocalypse that is the thinking power behind all of this. So don't be deceived by what the press is telling you. Oh, the Pope will mouth certain words when he stands at the window in the Vatican and speaks to the... Because he knows what they want to hear. But you haven't heard him do too much condemnation, have you, of the invasion of Ukraine. He's talked about the humanity side of it, but he, he hasn't condemned... He hasn't condemned Putin in the way that the other nations have. So you, there's something going on behind there, something we don't know about. So you've got the Babylonian thinking power. You've got the Western leg, of course, which is based in Rome. It's the latter-day redevelopment of the Western Roman Empire centred in Rome. You have the Eastern leg, the latter-day redevelopment of the Eastern Roman Empire centred in Constantinople. Okay, so this is what we're seeing. We're seeing be the beginnings of this formation of this great image power. And, of course, it'll take a little while longer, but we don't need to be here necessarily to see it. And the great drama of Daniel chapter 2 is that this image, this terrifying image, only stands complete when Gog is victorious in the land. So why can I say that? Because there's a fundamental principle, which Brother Thomas has pointed out, that there's got to be a collection of all of the territories that were once part of those four world empires. They're going to be brought together. And, of course, Gog will not be able to take in one of the most important lands of those four world empires. You know what it was? The land of Israel. And it's only when Gog is victorious in the land of Israel that that image can stand tall, stand upon its feet that are in the process of being formed in our times and beyond. Okay, got the picture? There's a drama there. And it is immediately toppled by Christ. So it doesn't stand up for very long in all its glory and power and showing its muscles. It stands up and then, bang! A stone power hits it and over she goes. That's the great drama. Broken and consumed over the next 40 years. Daniel 2.45 shows us the order of that destruction where it's enumerated for us. Shall we have a look at that? We'll have a look at verse 35 first of all because verse 45 says the same thing. If you have a look at verse 45 it says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces. Notice the order. It doesn't seem to be right, does it? it it's in reverse to what we read in verses 31 to 34. But it's mixed up as well. It break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold. You go back to verse 35 and you read the same thing. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. So you see what this is telling us is that there's an order in the destruction of the image. And that's going to take 40 years to complete. But there's an order in which it is done. So the first powers to be destroyed are described here as iron, clay and brass. What's the brass represent? Greek, isn't it? That's where the headquarters of the invasion came from, Constantinople, coming down through Turkey. All right? What does the iron represent? The thinking power behind all of this. You know, this is, this is, this is the Roman Empire referred to here. This is... This is the, the power under the, the tutelage of the Pope, you might say. These nations are involved because the Pope has induced them to be involved. So you've got the iron there of Rome. And the clay, of course, represents those republic, republican democratic nations of Europe that have now been brought into this very brittle uh, confederacy of powers. Iron and clay not mixing all that world together. What comes next in the destruction process? 
the silver. In other words, the region immediately adjacent to Israel, particularly those nations to the east, which of course where was the base of the Medo-Persian Empire. We would call them today Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, etc. And they are basically Muslim, aren't they? They're going to be much easier to convert than Catholics, who won't be converted, most of them anyway. Much easier to convert than Catholics, but they still won't submit without some pressure. So they're the next in the line. And of course that's why it says, I believe in Zechariah 14 verse 14, Judah shall fight in that day. Even the revived, purified nation of Israel, Judah in the prophetic in, in terminology, gets involved in that process. And then finally of course you've got the gold, the head of gold. It's the Babylonian power, Babylon the Great. It's the last to be destroyed and it takes 40 years to accomplish that because they will stand against the rule of Christ and they'll have to be crushed over many years as Elijah brings back Israel in the second exodus through the lands of Europe. They'll have to fight their way through to bring judgment upon Babylon the Great. So here's the grinding process. The iron, the brass and clay represent the revived Roman Empire formed by the Gogian Confederacy as described in Ezekiel 38 whose forces are destroyed on the mountains of Israel. The iron, of course, is the Catholic element, all that remains of the old Roman Empire. The brass is the Greek element, the Russian Orthodox Church reinstalled in its original place, where it came from, its original home, which is why Erdogan spat in Putin's face when he turned the Hagia Sophia from a museum into a Muslim mosque. You could see the rage on Putin's face because, of course, he's supported by the Russian Orthodox Church and that was the very worst thing you could do. This is like the Vatican to them. To the Catholics, it's like the Vatican to the Russian Orthodox Church. And so we have, of course, things building up towards that day. Constantinople being the headquarters of the invasion of the land and the base of the eastern leg of the image. The clay represents the Republican and mainly Catholic nations of Western Europe which have joined themselves with the Gogian Confederacy. Next to be ground to powder are the recalcitrant nations to the east of Israel, mainly Muslim as we said, in character and belief, namely the silver. Then finally, well down the track, the gold, the symbol for Babylon the Great, the thinking power behind it all, is the last enemy to be subdued. Now, God willing, in our next study, uh, in a fortnight's time, I think it is, we're going to have a look at Daniel chapter 3 very briefly, the Babylonian tree of chapter 4 very briefly, just to show where they fit in the scheme of things. But then we're going to focus on the first seven verses of Daniel chapter 7, which is why I reminded you that this chart that we've been using is very, very important. So let's just have a couple of final words about the chart. Here's your image. Now where you see it on the left hand side of the chart, it's telling us about the unfolding of world history. So you've got from Babylon, through Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, down to the times of the feet of the image, to our times. So that's why you've got it over on the left, because it's the fundamental, the fundamental platform upon which history from that time onwards is built. But over here on the right hand side you have the same image all right, see this shadow image behind the woman sitting upon the scarlet coloured beast of Revelation 17? That's because the image has to stand complete again in the latter days. Just as we've seen in our consideration, it's broken to pieces together. That's why it's over on the right hand side at the end of the times, the latter days. So that's something that I think hopefully is clear to us now. That's why you've got those two images there, one on the left and one on the right. So just going back to that point, in our next study, God willing, we're looking at the four beasts, the lion, number one, the bear, number two, the winged leopard, number three. We've got to come right over here to number four. And the question I ask you is this, during this next fortnight, if you get an opportunity, do a little bit of thinking about this chart and ask yourself this question, why is that beast, this fourth one, right over here? Well, what's he over here for? Because you see, it's lined up with Nebuchadnezzar's image. It represents the reforming 
of the nations, the ten nations that form the toes, the reforming of the Roman Empire south of the Rhine, not the Danube, which was the extent of the Roman Empire in its, in its heyday, all right? It represents the reforming of that power again. And in fact, all four have got to be there in the end. And we're going to see that in chapter 7. But only one will be totally destroyed of all of those four. And that will be, of course, the fourth kingdom, the Iron of Rome, Babylon the Great, totally destroyed off the earth. And the other nations given an opportunity during the millennial age. That's what's before us now in chapter 7.